in the first place, Kano has been the birthplace of political activism in northern Nigeria. Uh, the first thing that came when politics was about to start, that was mid-40s, mid with the formation of Kano Youth Association, headed by a good friend of mine, Nate Abdul-Anjaji, as a chairman, who led my Tomasule as secretary. I was a member. Quite a number of young people in Kano at that time were members of, like, of Kano Youth Association. It was Kano Youth Association that was invited as a founding unit to people in Zaria, like uh, Nuba Mali, Abu Bakr Imam, and the rest of them, to give birth to Northern People's Congress. Then the first meeting of Northern People's Congress, which took place in 1949, took place not in Kaduna or Zaria, but in Kano, because Kano was more convenient for people from all over northern Nigeria to host the formation of pan-northern organization like Northern People's Congress, NPC, than any other place. Now, the 1946 nationwide tour of the NCAA is the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroon, headed then by the father of Nigerian nationalism, Dr. Herbert Macaulay, uh, came to Kanu in 1946. I was uh, in a place called uh, Kenya, in Barbara, now in Juno State. But when I read about their coming, I came all the way. I didn't come because I knew what they were trying to do. But when I learned that it was going to be a big meeting of people coming from the South, uh, my, my interest was uh, prompted to take the trouble to take a lorry from that place, Kenya, to come. So after the NCNC, you youth all over northern Nigeria were mobilized. They did not join the NCLC because, unfortunately, at that time there was communication gap. NCLC people were speaking English. Most of the house people in Kano, northern Nigeria, were not speaking English. Very few people understood English at that time. So um, instead of jo them joining the NCNC, they decided forming their own organization, Kano Youth Association, Bauchi Discussion Circle, Sokoto Discussion Circle, and the rest of them. So later on, they were invited to a meeting in Zaria where uh, negotiation took place with the different youth associations from the northern part of the country to agree into creating a pan-northern Nigeria association organization that led to their decision to come to Kanu and launch the association in Kanu, Northern People's Congress. I don't know if I can go ahead. I will continue to say that after the formation of the Northern People's Congress in Kano, uh, then there was a debate as to that association, whether it should be a political party or a cultural organization. The meeting was divided into two groups. One group spearheaded by mostly Kano youth were supporting that organization to be a political party, the Northern People's Congress. 
and the other group wanted it to be a cultural organization. I think by way of strategy, those who thought that they were going to be defeated uh, moved a motion that they did not consult their people before coming to Kanu, and therefore the meeting should be adjourned to enable them and any other person to go, go back to his uh, place and consult his people whether they will support the creation of a political party or cultural organization. Then they carried the day and uh, they decided to meet uh, uh, the following year, 1950. Then by 1950, uh, they were more prepared and the meeting was in Kano and they were in Jaws and they went to Jaws for the meeting which was the second meeting of the Northern People's Congress. At just meeting, because the people who are opposed to the organization becoming a political group uh, were more prepared, because they were mostly little political officials. So they mobilized their supporters to populate the meeting in Georgia. So eventually the meeting decided to reject the move by the radical to turn the organization into a political party. Now, that was the reason why some people from Kano suspected that if they go to jobs, there is likelihood of uh, their being outwitted. So they said in the event that they are outwitted, they should form their own party. But they formed Nepal before they even went to George and took it there. When they were defeated, when they were outwitted, they contacted a number of delegates and told them about the formation of Nepal. That was how Nepal was formed. But what I wanted to say is that most of the people who came from Dagon, from Kaduna, from George, from Medjugorje to George at that time were traders who originally were from Kano. So they were the people who gave birth to political activism in Northern Nigeria. It's a very interesting history that many people actually don't know, even those who know a little bit about the history. Uh, but let me stay with you for the purpose of the young people who are following uh, us. Uh, uh, because, uh, as you know, uh, uh, the Kano, the late Laji uh, Meitema Sule, I was quite, quite, quite friendly with him. And um, every time that I came to Kano, we spent time talking about some of those days. Now, he was a minister, a federal minister, at a very, yes. very young age. One of the stories he used to tell me yes. was about uh, Prime Minister Tafal Balewa asking him if he has not gone across the aisle to go and prostrate and greet uh, 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 um, Awolowo and, and stuff like that. Yes. But uh, yes. the young people complain today that at 40, nobody takes them seriously. But yes. people like Alaji Maitamasule who were ministers in their 20s. Yes. Why do you think we have this kind of situation today compared to back those days? Well, um, what brought about this situation is the disconnect that occurred in Nigeria from what we started at the beginning of anti-colonial struggle to what is happening now. It was not only my Thomas today, my son, who, uh, who started political activism at the age of 20 plus. There are still some of my friends who are still alive, like Mbazbeke uh, Amechi, who is now, I'm sure, either listening to the house, is in uh, people like uh, yes, people like 
Ayo Faso Mi, who is in Oshun now, I'm sure he might be aware of this discussion. And people like uh, Ayo Adebanju were all in our early 20s, 30s. We are very active because at that time, nationalism was the pride of everybody. It was a great honor for a young man to be called a nationalist. That was our, the, the way of the honors. When we are to be introduced, they say, great nationalist. And we took, we took pride in that. That disconnect was brought about by military intervention is what is making Nigeria suffering from this setback in our country. About military rule. Um, yes. The promise of Nigeria in 1960 was huge. Uh, there are many people who yes. think Nigeria has not lived up to the promise of independence. And uh, yes. many yes. blame military rule significantly for why we are where we are. Speak to military yes. rule. You served in a military government as a commissioner in those days. But well, eight years, speak to yes. military rule, its origins, and what values we may have lost as a country as a result of military rule. Well, this, this patriotism, nationalism, like I told you before, in, at the beginning, it was a pride to call a Nigerian political activist a nationalist. I don't know if people now take pride when they are called nationalists, at least not to my knowledge. So the military intervention, which lasted for us for 13 years before we returned to political uh, activism in uh, during the Second Republic, you see, took a very long time, longer time than the time it took the nationalists to build political awareness in the country. 13 years of military rule, but from 1946 to 1967, uh, how many years? I can Six, remember. yeah. I mean, Somebody can keep. Hmm. 46 to... 20, 20, 20 years. years. Mm. Yes, that was the time. But actually, the time that we became independent in 1960 mm. was the time that we ought to take into account because the time previously yeah. was not under our control. Yeah. So from 1960 to 1967, it's that the was the time mm. when... Like, eh? So 66. Barely five years yes, and a little. To say six, yes. yes. To say six, yes. To say six, That was the actual time when, after our independence, we were really given freedom to play politics the way we think it should be played. So this is this is this is this is the greatest uh, setback that political development in Nigeria has suffered from which we are still suffering. One of the things that military rule did was that because of the command and control nature of the army, a general at the yes. top giving orders to a colonel uh, at, uh, say, subnational level, very hierarchical, yes. it significantly affected Nigeria's federal structure. Today, there's a lot of talk yes. about restructuring, federalism, and all of this. What is your take on the discussion of restructuring? Uh, I prefer to use decentralization and taking power down to the grassroots. Subnational governments in the 60s, a lot of the developments that we saw came from the subnational level. I, I lived in Kano, in Guzo, back in those days. You could see the development being from bottom up. And today, everything is top down. Abuja, Abuja, Abuja. And person in Abuja doesn't know what's going on in Karanamoda, but he's supposed to make those decisions. Uh, what is your take on restructuring? 
Well, um, yeah, Rob, talking probably, you ask a question to a wrong person. Why? Because I am a committed Nigerian who believe in a strong Nigeria. I don't believe in a weak Nigeria. Way back as 1953, I was one of the youths. I was leader of Nepal Youth Association. When we mobilized people of Kano and delegate to the Constitutional Conference in London in 1953, we are going through Kano. We mobilized thousands of people from the villages and so on to come to the airport yes. to protest against what they call a nine or eight point program of the NPC, which was advocating for Nigeria to be a confederal system, to have a confederal system of government. I'm not a confederalist. I am a strong Nigerian because I believe that all the strong nations that we have today in this world are strong because of a lot of things, but the main thing are two things, the population and territory, which we have in Nigeria. This is the reason why we are the biggest country in Africa. So I don't believe that Nigeria should be a weak country, it should be a strong country. The issue is the mismanagement. The mismanagement is not the responsibility of the politicians in the olden days. If you look at the beginning of our independence, everybody will respect our leaders because if you look at Western Nigeria, Chiba Olo, as the leader of Western Nigeria, introduced free education for everyone. If you look at the Eastern Nigeria, the Tenaji Azikwe was the leader of the NCNC, which was the party that was controlling Eastern Nigeria, was talking of national unity. He had local programs for Eastern Nigeria. In fact, I read something recently that compared the progress of Nigeria at that time to that of Western Nigeria. And the gentleman who wrote that at school actually by facts showed that the achievement in Eastern Nigeria at that time were far better than the achievement in Western Nigeria. Now, the achievement of Northern Nigeria, one time they look uh, became the, the premier of Northern Nigeria. The main uh, confront, uh, the, the, the problem that confronted him was the issue of getting Northerners into a key place in the government of Northern Nigeria. Because at that time, I believe about 90% of all the employees, the civil servants in the government of Northern Nigeria were non-Northerners, either expatriates or Southerners. So because of that, the problem that confronted Sabadi Bello when he was first uh, leader of government business in Northern Nigeria was how to get Northerners to occupy the position of responsibility in the government of Northern Nigeria. Particularly when the motion for independence was moved by Chief Inohoro, late Chief Inohoro in 1953, and which led Sardona to oppose. What made Sardona realize was that the if Nigeria, because the motion was for Nigeria to be independent in three years' time, from 1953 to 1956, that is, will be in three years' time. He realized that in three years' time, as leader of government business at that time, he cannot get northerners to be ready 
to handle responsibility of running the government at that time. So he, uh, Sadona, believed that there will be no peace in Nigeria if Nigeria is given independence in 1956. And when most of the civil servants in the government of Northern Nigeria, 90% or 80%, will be Northerners. So in order to create a stable situation, Sadona insisted that that motion should be amended to as soon as practicable. I was not a member of his party. I've never been an MPC member. I was a NAPU member right through. I was I rose to the level of National Publicity Secretary and National Secretary of the NAPU. And to today, except when we came together in the year period of NPN, I've never worked with NPC people. But I, I, I appreciate, and in fact, including our leaders like American, uh, 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 and others, they also appreciated this foresight of Sir Amadou Bello in opposing uh, self-government or independence in three years' time from 1953 to 56, because the North will not be ready for it. Let, let me... Um... Uh, and stay with you on opposition politics. I, I, I recall uh, very much the demonstration you, you mentioned at the airport in Kanu to, uh, yes. uh, when, uh, when uh, Saramadu Bello and Co. were going up to the Constitutional Conference in 1953. Yes. It was part of a very yes. strong tradition of opposition politics. Um, yes. Today, people think of opposition politics in Nigeria as a bit of a joke. There is extreme yeah. in positions that people take. On the one hand, they are extremely partisan. On the other hand, they give, it, they give real little value opposition. What has happened to opposition yeah. politics in Nigeria? How do you compare it today to back when you, in Nepu, I know you were in and out of uh, uh, arraignment, in prison, and all of that. You're one of the most persecuted politicians in Nigerian That's history. Right. That's right. How... That's right. how has opposition politics changed in Nigeria? Um, now, in my opinion, opposition politics has not been played on the basis of ideology. This is the reason why you find so many people forming political parties just to get registered because at the beginning, there was a policy that registered political parties should be sub given subvention by the government. So most people who form political parties to oppose the government of the day were not largely driven by patriotism, but rather by hope that they will make money. And Unfortunately for Nigeria, the politics in Nigeria has destroyed itself, destroyed business, destroyed uh, 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 profession. People who go into business, they will be contractors. The moment they got money, they will like to go and invest the money in politics, in the business out of which they made money. The same, go everywhere, you will see the, 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 the thinking is how much money can I get from politics. So the result is that politics is now the main business. Either to go and become a councillor in local government and get money or chairman in local government and get money, or member of state assembly, or member of national assembly, or governor, or even president, to make money. And they make money, a lot of them. So what the challenge we are facing is how do we reorient the psyche of Nigerians on politics? 
because politics is a necessity for development. You cannot develop any nation without politics, without democracy. You cannot have a democracy without politics because in a democracy there is competition, opposition government, opposition party, government party, which will compete with the other on the basis of program, what they can do to enhance the program of the country. Once that is not the main thing, main preoccupation of what you for people in government, in legislature and so on, then everything has gone to places. So we have to see how we can turn back the orientation of Nigerians from this money mongering into patriotism and nationalism. Politics as service. I mean, that was what people like you stood for. Politics as service with clear ideas about how society should be organized. Nepu was a people-centered political party going for how to improve the lots of the masses. If you look at the Nigerian political firmament today, you cannot seem to identify a party that's about the people. Almost all yes. the politics of now is about self, the individuals. Yes. Yes. Bearing this in mind, and in fact taking as a good example, a disgraceful situation with the NDDC that we are all watching on TV live and yes. how politicians are just pilfering and pillaging and bringing the country to a, a, a disgrace in front of the eyes of the world. What kind of ways can political parties organize to go against this kind of politics that we see now in Nigeria? There are many people in National Assembly who meet you privately and they say, look, we can't help it. That's the way things happen. If we speak up, we'll be in trouble. People like you spoke up about things you didn't believe were right. How should we uh, reorient politicians today to see the evil in the kind of thing that most of our politics represents today very clearly? Uh, as we can see in a few of the, the EFCC crisis, the uh, NDDC crisis, everywhere is scandal, scandal. And we're supposed to be in a uh, anti-corruption era. And this is what we're seeing. What will happen if we're in the corruption era? You know, well, what do you think we should be doing? How should we sanction politicians and people who have put the country in this, in a time of enormous poverty, these kinds of money are being spent? Well, um, it's not only the politicians, the civil servants, the academics, almost everybody. Now, uh, don't forget that everything has an origin. The origin of this was that when the military took over, by the time they handed over power in 1979. Uh, uh, 1979. 1979. Thank you very much. You know, I'm getting old. Yes. Uh, so, um, uh, by the time they handed over power, you can count more military or million Millionaires from military background than politicians from political background. So the result was that by the time we started policies again in 1979, the problem uh, was how to do away the thinking of the people who come to power from trying to copy the example of the military. It is a terrible situation. And I can tell you, I don't know if you have the time, but I can give a quick example. Please, go ahead. There was a time, yeah, yes, when election took place in 1979, the military, Obasanjo, administration. They did not prepare. I'm not saying they did it deliberately, but they did not prepare 
for the people to be elected how to be taken care of. Members of National Assembly, you know, I serve as special advisor to President Shagari yes. on National mm -hmm. Assembly, but for members of the National Assembly who went to Lagos were kept at Badagari Road, what do you call this place? Uh, yeah, I, I remember the, 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 the Constituent, Constituent Assembly, the Satellite Town area. Satellite Town, that's right. Uh -huh. <laughs> the members, senators and members of the House of uh, Representatives were kept there. Look at the distance from Satellite Town to Chabal Square. Square. Another time, they had no cars of their own. They had to take a taxi. They had to pay for taxi to take them from that place to Tabakwayo Square, mm. Square to attend the meeting. At the time when members of the National Assembly were elected in 1979, even their salaries, their allowances were not determined, were not decided. So when they wanted to, they, they, they were complaining that they were going to the assembly and they had no money to hire a taxi and they had they were forced to, to, to borrow money and they they wanted to fix salary for themselves it was one of the first clashes that took place between members of the national assembly and president Shadai. they said they, they 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 decided to allocate salaries and allowances for themselves and Shagari said, Shagari said he would not sign it. And there was a big problem. Even members of the NPN, I can remember a very prominent member of the NPN who was very hostile to Shagari. He was a senator at that time. But Shagari said, no, he should not approve their allowances. But the man was tell, telling the truth that, look, I cannot afford to take myself from uh, satellite town to to to, to, up anywhere to attend a meeting of the National Assembly. I cannot afford it. So that was how it came about. So the result was that things were not prepared for that. And then we had to find a solution. A compromise was reached. Something was done. But that issue of money in the psyche of people who went to the National Assembly from the example they saw from the military. Because in, in my opinion, according to my observation, the first time you had millionaires in the military was at that time. So you expect somebody from uh, 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 movie in in in, 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 in Adamawa to go to Lagos and only to take loan to pay transportation taxi from his place and he has no accommodation of his own to be sustaining himself when he know that somebody a military man in his constituency was in money. And this is what changed the orientation of the political activism from service to the country into money. So until we do away with this thinking, because to today, you can mention people who are really rich and who made them money. So, right? Military governance out of being big civil servant, permanent secretary of the government, or out of contract that they got from their military uh, friends uh, that made them to overnight to be millionaires. So this is the main challenge in Nigeria. You people, you the academia people, have the responsibility to consider this to see how we can change the mantra of Nigerians 
politician, politician and non-politician alike, from this thinking of making money into service to their country. Something happened like what is happening to, what happened to Nigeria, or what is happening in Nigeria. In South Korea, those who know the history of South Korea, yes. South Korea was at one time in a bad situation as Nigeria today. But when a military man passed to him, the father of the first uh, uh, woman president of Korea, South Korea, uh, he was a military man. But later on, he became a civilian, he resigned, he formed a political party of his own. But when he got power, he collected people who took money from public money and made arrangements because there were so many that there were too many for him to handle. So he decided, I don't know whether it was his idea or somebody suggested it to him, to negotiate with them that they should bring back their money. The money would be their own, but it would be invested to construction of roads, to railway system, to all development program in, 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 in South Korea. I believe you are aware of Park Lee. Yes, indeed. Of, of I, um, so this kind of thing need, is what we need in Nigeria to change the mantra of Nigerian politicians and non-politicians alike. Yes. Thank you so, so very much for that insight. We are Do going to be... Uh, no, no, no. We have a few Bro. more minutes, uh, but we're going to uh, exit uh, Bro. Um, Instagram and continue you. speaking with you. I can't hear you. Okay, we're going to exit Instagram. I can't hear you. Uh, we're going to exit Instagram uh, shortly, uh, but we'll continue for I a little bit. You, on, uh, okay. Uh, what about this? But I'm not hearing you. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. You're back. All right. Okay. Thank you so very much. We're going to exit this platform, Instagram, in the next one minute. But we'll continue for a few more minutes on, um, on Zoom. And, and then we'll continue the program after you take a rest. We'll stretch you quite a bit. Uh, it is not easy to be what ninety four years old. As you, you know, it's you are a treasure to this country to, to have you still giving us all this history. Uh, but you know, the point we were making about uh, the military, money, uh, politics. You know, another a friend of mine from Kano, Belo Maitema yeah. Yusuf Bemko, was in the Constituent yeah. Assembly there yeah. in, in, in satellite. Yeah. Uh, in 1977, and I, you know, I used to yes. Yes. go and visit with him and a friend of, yes. a friend of ours, Mohammed Andakanu Chav, Mohammed Taib. And yes. the argument that I, I remember that I used to make in those days was that young business people were coming into politics. Many of their friends of the military who made money yes. under the military, like like yes. uh, Bello himself. Uh, and I, I wondered yes. if they were going to bring enough discipline that will be different from the military tradition. But that has unfortunately uh, yeah. not evolved uh, uh, through the years that we follow that military tradition and that's why our politics is uh, as messy as it is now. But you were commissioner for finance uh, you know, in Kano yeah. for several years. Yeah. How has the nature of the economy changed yeah. that has put us in the crisis we are in? What was the economy like in the 60s in Kano, and why is the economy the way it is today? Being a, a Kano boy, was I don't I remember those years. Mm -hmm. The economy was booming. At that time, when, we were, uh, when I was a commissioner, Kano had the second biggest budget in the whole of Nigeria, out of the 12 states that were existing at that time. And like what General Gawang has said at that time, that money was not 
their problem at that time. The problem was how to spend the money. So um, Kano and also the country was booming comparatively. But at that time, the thinking was how to develop it. Take, for instance, the decision by Governor Aldo to change Kano because Kano is the, the center of granite activities. So he wanted to make sure that that situation was definitely. So the first thing that came to his mind was a irrigation company in Kano. By the time Alba left Kano, he built more than 13 to 15 dams, big and small. Some of the water supply, some for the matter of farming and so on. Yes, yes, let me listen to you. I said, yes, 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 yes. I was going to ask you very quickly because we are leaving Instagram now to announce that all those on Instagram can continue on Zoom because we will continue the conversation on Zoom. We will exit Instagram uh, in a, a moment. But I was going to say that the point I was trying to make is all the development initiatives, the dams, all of those came from Kano. Today, everybody waits yes. for Abuja to do it. Is that an effective way to develop? Zaudu Bako no. as governor did so much. Well, you see, why we are in this situation is because we have only one bigger source of generating revenue in Nigeria. That's the problem, oil. yes. If we had developed agriculture, I saw a plan on agriculture that if it is implemented, Agriculture will give Nigeria three times the amount of revenue oil is given to Nigeria today. I have I, I will give you a copy of that program when we meet personally. So it's the question of the program. If we will turn our attention into developing agriculture, whatever agriculture will be there, oil will go away sooner or later. But if the only if we are developing if we have developed agriculture and we are getting three times the, the revenue we are getting from oil, then that will make us have more money to share. And therefore people there will be tendency to expand. If you take the first development plan of Tapa I don't know if we have the time. Well, I have the time. It's you that the I am worried about giving thing. you enough time to rest. We have the time, yes. They will give me five minutes to go. Go, go ahead. If you want ten, I will be very happy. Yes, okay. I need to mm. go to speak. Uh, you, know, you know, I have been getting many questions. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, uh, very dear friends, um, uh, as we realize, Elijah Tanko Yakusa is 94 years old, and we've kept him already for more than one hour, so he's going to go to the bathroom briefly uh, uh, and rejoin us uh, before we move to the next uh, segment. We have with us at this time, so we're wrapping up on Instagram Live. So thank you if you are with us on Instagram Live. Please switch to Zoom as he returns will be only on Zoom. Uh, there are many questions that are coming in and I, I want to... Uh, the Zoom link is out there. Uh, if you check the invitation, you, you have the uh, uh, Zoom link. So on the... on the, um, the Our bio uh, in Instagram, we also have the Zoom link. So if you don't have the invitation in your Instagram, from the bio there, you can uh, move to Zoom and we'll continue. But we have already on Zoom with us somebody that I'm already seeing, Admiral Jibrila Ayinla. Admiral Ayinla was Chief of Naval Staff, was Minister 
in health and in uh, commerce and industry. Uh, I don't know what it was called in those days. It kept, kept changing. Uh, we also have BC Olatilo. Uh, uh, both uh, BC Olatilo and Arbila Inla and myself were little boys in Kano uh, on October 1, 1960 when Nigeria became uh, independent. And um, uh, Admiral Anjila uh, uh, keeps telling us that he was a big bully, bullying all of us. <laughs> but um, it'd be good to talk about Kano during those those days. Uh, and I would like to... Uh, uh, BC Olati Law, for example, I like to offer a remark, speaks fluent Igbo. Uh, uh, and he was nowhere near... Igbo land. He learned it in Kano. And a couple of examples. Even I mean, I, I lies to speak some Igbo before he used his own to sell Akara somewhere. <laughs> but, <laughs> and, yeah. Admiral, what was Kano yes. like in 1960? Oh, Kano was a melting pot. It was a melting pot of Nigeria. We, uh, okay. all our small kids went to school together. <laughs> Uh, but there was a Union school, there was uh, uh, Trinity, UNA, St. Thomas's and all that. And uh, we all grew up together. Nigeria was uh, what it should be. Uh, we didn't care where anybody came from when we were in school. It was uh, who did well in uh, mathematics or who did well in English or did better in geography that defined you as a kid at that time, or who played good football, or who was a good athlete. We were all just Nigerians. We went uh, to spend holiday with our colleagues, whether they were in Birni or in uh, Kofarmata or in, Magwar or in uh, Gwagwarua at that time, to go to our colleagues and spend time with them. As, as you mentioned, I went to Ibo Union Grammar School. Yes, indeed. I was going to and get to that. I mentioned it earlier this morning. You went to yes, Ibo Union I, Grammar School. I went to Ibo Union Grammar School, and people don't know the antecedent of that school. The antecedent was that there was this Ibo Union. They had a meeting every Sunday. Ibo State Union. Mm. Igbo State yeah. Union, they had meeting one Sunday. Mm. And, uh, mm. Even some of us who are not Igbos, we still attended. Such mm. They decided at that meeting to contribute and build schools. Mm. And three schools mm. were built. Igbo mm. Union Grammar School Kano, Igbo Union Grammar School Kafanchan, and what you people didn't know, Igbo National High School in Aba was mm. a contribution of people in Kano, this, who built that school. And of course, the school was open to everybody, whether you were Igbo or not, or this thing. Once you pass the entrance exam, you were in. We had in our class the uh, Ayasani, Isiaku Abdullahi, and all that, whom I can remember, as well as uh, my Igbo uh, counterparts. I went and spent holiday in uh, our mama in Olu with uh, the Hemesin was as a kid, you know? Nigeria was what it should be at that time. We had, we had, you know, come a long way from those days. Unfortunately, we went through some accidents of history. One of them was the program in the North at that time, the Civil War. And of course, uh, if I would touch the other part, it was the June, June 12 uh, debacle that set back Nigeria. Um, I would talk of the military and government. Yes. The military and government was an accident of history. Hmm. You know, a society is made up of all its parts. The military was just a microcosm of Nigeria. Everybody had a part to play in the military coming to government. In fact, my senior colleagues said they were urged by the society to come into government. Unfortunately, we did not take full advantage of military and government. Military and government, you can uh, allude to, uh, to South Korea example. settings like, like South Korea, like Argentina, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so many others. Military and government should have brought discipline to government, should have saved the cost of government. Unfortunately, we derailed somewhere. And that derailment is not 
blamed only on the military, but in the society as a whole. You just talk now, during the military government, for example, in a state, you had a military governor. All the commissioners were not military. All the heads of departments in civil service were not military. So if you are in a government and your governor is not listening to you, what should you do? You should resign and cry out to the people. Hmm? We never had people resigning or disagreeing with their boss. Nobody could go before the head of the ancestors. Yeah? Let's do it differently. It shouldn't be this way. Mm. I believe we all have to share in the blame. In the blame. Of whatever mm. happened to Nigeria. I haven't come through that history. Let us now look back. Look back and see where we got it wrong. Okay. I'm not repeating things. Do you know now, I can tell you for free, that some of the governments we have are worse than military. Yes. Our, mm. our, our retinue of, 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 uh, of staff, mm. of uh, uh, advisors, and that the number of cars you line up when going anywhere and all that. You can't have government like that. Government is too expensive. Mm. If you have government that is too expensive, you don't have development. Mm. And you know one of the things I hate, which we have developed, is that of you look at government as they the talks of government are they the mm. professors and all that at the university are saying they they we are all government mm. we should own government we should hold on to ownership and hold government to account we shouldn't be saying they and we no we are all government that's one of the things the other thing i find is that we all know the problem but nobody prefers a solution let me give us three solutions to some pro inter intractable problems. One, the youth. Mm. I have written a paper once and I've circulated it that the National Youth Corps should be expanded to include all those who graduate, not from universities, but even from schools. We should have two tiers or three tiers <laughs> of National Youth Service. All the youth should remain in the National Youth Service until they get employed. And we have to find money to go in, whatever their allowances are, whatever their stipends are. That's one. Two, in no place in the world do I hear of uh, all this joint venture, joint venture thing. We should pull out of joint ventures. The IOCs will explore, exploit, and do whatever they need to do. We don't have to contribute one. is that all the expenses are lumped on the joint venture. All, including going to watch football in Germany. Mm. Okay? So let's do away with joint venture, not only for petroleum, but for all our industries. Okay? The investor should invest, leave it to the private sector. That's another solution. The third one I want to talk about is this question of uh, the structure of our nation. Yes, Nigeria is a complex country. Mm -hmm. uh, no government can succeed where you have subsystems that work. And I'm, when I'm talking of subsystems of government, you see, one man at the top cannot make a forest. One tree cannot make a forest. All those who have to work with him have to work in synergy with him. That means if he head of the fish is clean, then the whole body of must be clean. You understand? Yeah, the fish I mean? from the head. The fish from the head. And so if the head of the fish is clean, then the whole fish has to be clean. We all have to take, you know, pride in service. Service to the nation. Service to the nation is, you know, incumbent on you once you take uh, appointments in, in, uh, in government, yeah. you have to look it, at it as a service, as a sacrifice. You are not there to make gains. You are there to provide a good environment for your, grand for your children and grandchildren oh, so that they don't suffer the same thing we went through, so that they won't have dark nights. Yes. They won't have candle lit dinners all the time. Hmm? I was telling yes. somebody that my, my candle lit dinners. The first well. time I used the shoe, the first 
the first time I used the shoe was the day I was passing out of it on grammar school. The same thing like uh, President Jonathan would say, don't wear shoes. We all didn't wear shoes. <laughs> yes. We yeah, one of shoes. the shoe problem people. Uh, yes, my mother, my mother bought me a butter shoe the day I was going to graduate because I was going to collect prizes, <laughs> trousers for the first time. Okay. Let's look Thank at my you. It's our nation. <laughs> Is our nation? It would be whatever we think it would be. I mentioned before. I mentioned before that we have the best brains in this country. Let us harness them and use them to our advantage. Yes, we blame the colonial past for a long time of our illness, of our illness. Now we blame the military for so long and everything. Now the military has gone. Let's look at the future. Let's look at where the mistakes we have made and try to correct them and make sure that the, the Nigeria we present to our children and grandchildren will be better than what we have. Thank you so very Thank much, you. Admiral Ayala. I appreciate uh, your being with us. Uh, uh, Laji Tanko Yekesai is uh, back. Um, uh, I see Professor Jibo Ibrahim there, but there are questions that we need to... Uh, uh, ask Alaji Yakasai before we bring on uh, Jibo Ibrahim, who, uh, like Admiral uh, Inla, myself, in fact, Jibo and I both went to St. Thomas's Primary School uh -huh. in Kano uh -huh. at that uh -huh. time. Um, so uh, let me return to uh, uh, Jibo, we're coming to you in a minute, uh, but let me return to Alaji Yakasai and just ask a couple of the questions that are there. Uh, uh, one of the questions says that uh, uh, you said that you want a strong Nigeria. Was Nigeria stronger in the 60s than it is today? Certainly. Certainly. Yes. I, I'm back to you. It was stronger in terms of national orientation. Certainly, okay. the constitution was a different one. Mm original setup and so on. But every Nigerian at that time was proud to be a Nigerian. Okay. This is now, not the case now. Mm -hmm. How can we uh, make Nigerians all have a stronger claim, a stronger ownership of Nigeria today? Because today, most people feel they don't matter. The politics has not been fair. Uh, uh, you are... Uh, chairman of a group called Jepuin, which is about justice, equity, and peace in Nigeria. How can we ensure that there is enough justice and equity so that we can have peace and unity in Nigeria? It depends on two things. The mindset of the members and also the arrangement. Uh, that group, I'm the chairman, is called Right, but uh, I was not among the founders. I'm still searching to find out exactly the intention of the founders. But it's a good thing, it's a good attempt. And uh, I think by the way we are going, we'll be able to understand each other better and probably we'll fine tune the thinking of the entire membership and probably by the time something happened that would be more proactive uh, the psyche the, the, the mantra will be a better than it is today i will mm -hmm. like to say something quickly right because i didn't know the admiral the, I, I want people to understand that I was asked a question as to how did we derail from the yes. path of development. And I said it was the military uh, intervention. The military who started this, they went. They, 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 they were the young people. But you don't do it, you, you, you don't uh, do away with thinking of consequences. When you took over power, you start by killing people. They have people, they have relations, they have sympathizers. Then you are not thinking of the consequences of that. 
all these the derailments so were the consequences of that killing, which was wrong. So I'm, 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 I'm not, I served under the military, military governor of Kano State, Abdu Bako, for eight years. And tomorrow, if Abdu Bako will be back, he asked me to serve, and in spite of my age, I will serve under him because I know he's a committed person, honest Nigerian. Yes, he was quite honest. Man, man with foresight. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is. He mm -hmm. is. I'm saying he is honest. You know, I know many, many of us re recount his um, accomplishments and his integrity, Abdu Bako, uh, from that era. Yes. Mm. Well, thank you so very much. You know, I had promised that we will not keep you too long because we know what it is to take somebody who has been ar around as long as you have been uh, uh, to be out here with us. But we, we truly uh, value your contribution. And if you continue uh, sitting you, to watch our deliberation, we'll be even much happier. There's still a few questions for you here, but I don't know if it's fair to uh, uh, keep you any further. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've we need to be around. Seen, okay. Yes, I've already seen my friend. Aha. Uh -huh. um, okay. He was waiting for me in the double tray. We greeted and back. Aha. Uh -huh. Go on. Okay. Yes, if what, what, wonderful. Now, one question is about yes. uh, the new new generation of political leaders. Is asked what advice uh, can you yes. give them uh, so that we can have a new Nigeria. Uh, the person thinks this current generation of leaders are a complete washout and that we need a new generation of leaders. Uh, what advice can you give the uh, emerging leaders? I don't know whether it's advice or appeal. Appeal, okay. If you agree, I would rather appeal to them. That sure. Don't let them go to politics in order to make money. Grab money. Yes. They can still survive without grabbing money. I am 94. I brought 23 children. Four are dead. 19 are alive. Every one of them is a university graduate with master's degree, PhD, and so on. Originally, before I joined politics, I was a tailor. I didn't go to any former school. I, I tried hard to, to no learn how to read and write. Eh? You want to talk? No, no go I ahead. Tried hard to, uh, I tried hard to learn how to read and write. And now I can read and I can write. I can speak in English, which is not my mother tongue. What I will advise them to do, let them go to politics for the purposes of rebuilding this country. Because the younger people now own the country, this country or any country, we the older people, I don't know if I, if I stay for another five or 10 years, I'll be lucky. So they have the country. Don't let them go into politics for the purposes of making money. They can, do you know what I do for a living today, in spite of my age, 94? I collect polythene and process them and sell them to make a living. Although my children are taken care of by needs, but I realize that the contribution they are making to me is not enough and it will not be fair for me to demand more. So I decided to earn a living. This is what I'm earning a living, even though I'm 94. Fantastic. They can do it. You can be, you can, you can earn a living. You can, you don't have to go to politics for making money. You can go to politics for service for your country and still work to earn a living. Thank you so, so very much. Let me go to Professor Jibo Ibrahim. Jibo. Uh, uh, Jibo, can you hear me?
Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. I can hear you. Can All right, you. lovely. Welcome. Um, you are a political scientist. You are a canoe thoroughbred. From your perspective, uh, can you speak to Kanu as a hotbed of opposition politics and the nature of how civil society in Kanu has made Kanu politics sort of different from a good part of uh, surrounding territory in northern Nigeria through the years going back from the 60s to today. But I give an example. Uh, Kanu is one of those states where it is said until very recently that uh, you, you couldn't rig an election easily. Uh, um, Kanu used to have one-term governors and people stood up, held up for their vote and all of that. What has given Kanu that tradition? I think uh, part of it has to do with the nature of Kanu as a cosmopolitan center where you have uh, different people with different occupations, different ethnic and religious background, all working together, working beside each other. And the important thing about Kano politics from the very beginning was that it was always ideological politics. You've always had, uh, as uh, Alaji Tankoyak, as I said, very strong opposition politics in Kano around the Nepu movement and even preceding it. But at the same time, there's always been a very strong establishment in Kano. Those that are for the status quo, those that want things to continue the way they are. And I think the confrontation between these two ideological camps gave life to kind of uh, politics. And uh, this is what continued for a very long time. I think the other element in Kano kind of politics is the way in which people acted according to their belief. And there was a culture of fearlessness that arose. And I think the history of Nepal was very important in molding Kano's political uh, character. The fact that people were ready to go to jail for what they believed in, that people were prepared to work for the party they supported without pecuniary benefits, simply because they believe in its ideals. These were very important in determining the political uh, character of uh, Kano. The final issue is the fact that Kano was a very strong early industrializer and had a working class, a working class that was mobilized. A lot of them were in trade unions. And that was uh, very important in giving people the structure around which uh, they could organize. So these are, for me, the key issues. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I have some young people who are co-hosts. I had stolen the question of one of them, uh, my daughter, my 19-year-old daughter in the United States. Uh, 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 I had asked her a question earlier, but I think now that, uh, because I thought that we were going to have uh, Laji Ekesai uh, probably leave after the first 15 minutes, but he's... Uh, strong enough to stay with us. So I don't know if we can go to her uh, and uh, uh, let her ask uh, another question. Since, and I apologize for stealing one of her questions, so to speak. But I asked it on her behalf anyway. Uh, where is Claire? OK. Yes, hi, everyone. And Daddy actually took two of my questions, but it's all right. Um, but I guess in general, as a point who had seen the extreme evolution of the nation and to where we are now. I think my main question is, how can we return to a sense of service within the youth especially? Because I think as a working class, political, um, working class, middle class, the elite, you might say, have failed the nation to a large extent. That notion of noblesse oblige, meant to serve, we've kind of lost that. 
So how can we start instilling either through education or programs, things that will allow us to get that sense of activism, that sense of nationalism, to want to serve the country and use our resources appropriately? That was pretty much. Okay, and I think that both uh, Elijah Kesai and Professor Ibrahim can uh, take a stab at that uh, question from uh, Claire. Claire is an undergraduate uh, at UPenn. Uh, if Elijah Tanko could start. Laji Tenko Yekisai, young people are asking uh, about this challenge we raised before. Yes. No, um, I, I, I was disconnected somehow when she was speaking. So can you summarize? Yeah, what really briefly. Said? Basically, how do we reinstill that sense of service in my generation, either through education or other programs? Definitely, I think nationalism is something that isn't touched on as much in schools, and so it's kind of drifted away. So how do we reinstill that kind of sense of service to get us reinvolved in politics and activism? I, I can't... I I'm disconnected. We have a connection problem. Uh, uh, well, maybe Jibo, you if you had that, could you yeah, come yeah, in? Yeah, I have the question. Okay. Uh, yeah, how do you inspire uh, a new generation did with you a sense the, of service? My sense is that uh, every generation has a responsibility to discover it. We tend to have one narrative in this country that the young generation has grown to see their elders focused on massive theft of national resources. And therefore, uh, that's the mold they want to fit into. I don't think it's really true. Yes, for some of them, that's their mission in life. But I think a lot of them have a much grander vision of their future and their role in it. Just look at Nigerian literature. We have a massive number of young writers in their 20s and 1930s. And when you read their novels, their poems, their songs. We are controlling a lot of the African music industry. It's really about playing an active role to rediscover the future of our dreams. I think there's a sense in which, therefore, what's already happening is that the current generation is discovering. There's a sense in which our generation has lost the capacity to even advise them because we are such bad examples ourselves on what, the, on what the youth should do. So I don't even think they should look up, up to us for inspiration on what they can do to move this nation. But looking around the life they live, living around the society they've been brought into, a number of things are absolutely clear to them, the most important of which is that we are headed towards total destruction. The security in our society has collapsed. Uh, violence has taken over. The sense of responsibility for people occupying public trust has completely disappeared. And that inspires people with a serious mind only in one direction. What can we do to get out of that situation? So for the young Miss uh, told me my thinking is, forget about us advising you. You come out, discover your world, discover your mission, tell us off, 
struggle to get us out of positions of authority. We are no longer useful. The future is yours to grab. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Chairman, okay, please, please, if I may contribute. And ask another quick question before we move to... Chairman, please, else. if I can conclude before you go on to the next question, please. I wanted to say that, uh, yes, please, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, let's, let's then go, if you can hear me, can we go to um, uh, Mr. Delia Jufo? No, no. Mr. Delia Jufo okay. wants to ask a question. I wanted to contribute to what uh, uh, Professor Jibrin has, my name Seka, just said. I think we need to rejig our education curriculum. Uh, we need to rejig our education curriculum because uh, they don't teach history anymore in schools. Hey, my brother. Uh, they don't teach history anymore in schools. I want to put it on this one. It's still on. Uh, yeah, I was looking for you at this. Uh, you know. Very true. Very, very true fact. Uh, uh, Ila has been talking. You're on. Eh? You're on top of the Yes, platform. I'm on. I, I wanted to say they don't teach oh, okay. history anymore in so, schools. We have Mr. to Lassiba study the there. British Constitution, and we let came across Let me get the uh, uh, cross Magna Carta, Hibia's Corpus, me, Petition of Rights, and all that. You don't let our children study these okay. things, so they don't know how governments evolve. They don't know how services evolve. Oh, we have to go back to our true. education, especially uh, in the in the lower levels and teach them history, teach them yeah. civics. You know, you mentioned that uh, we had a head of state who was uh, 30, 32. We had gov governors and, uh, and uh, ministers who were 29 and under. So there's nothing wrong with our youth. We shouldn't deprive them of the, study, the English, the studies we had. If they have those studies, they won't allow you to do what you are doing now. When I talked about subsystems, it had to do with some of these things, the education. Education is not just in the, in the, in the, in the classroom. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I very much agree. Uh, am I allowed to talk now? Yeah, okay, yes, please go on. Uh, I, think, well, I was going to have this interaction with Alaji Tanko Yakasai. He's still right there. Yeah, yeah, Alaji, are you there? No, uh, Sawaba. Sawaba. Thank you very much. I, I, I don't know how many people realize what I'm saying. The era of Tanko Yakasai was the era of nationalism when nobody cared where you came from. Uh, those days when they came to Joss for rally, most of us were at the township stadium to support in the 50s. We talked about freedom. Sawaba, Sawaba for Duka. Today, we don't talk about Sawaba. We talk about North. We talk about Igbo. We talk about Fulani. All hegemonic talks. How are we going to conquer this one? Because as of today, people are already talking about 2023 when we are not governing yet. How do we combat the narrative? How do we come back to normalcy, to govern, and bring about proper leadership? Uh, there are some tribalism in the 50s. I remember um, Amadou Bello's interview where he said that if they didn't have any foreigner to do their jobs, they would, rather, they would hire a southerner but on contract. We, we ignore those things because the southerner will still work in the north. Mm -hmm. But today it is impossible for us to interact. How do we curb this menace of tribalism, which is eating us deep today? I think that is the problem of Nigeria. I don't know how Alaji Tankoyaka Sai sees it. When I saw him, nostalgia, I sang the song, Freedom, Freedom for Everybody. Alaji, over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Freedom for you, freedom for me. Everywhere there must be freedom. Freedom, freedom, freedom for you, freedom for me. Everywhere there must be freedom. Thank you. Freedom. Thank you very much. So um, when I was advising our younger ones, I would like to uh, say that uh, I like to correct if you will not be offended. My younger brother, 
Professor Jibril, that let the younger one listen to us. Take the best out of us. We are still around because the little we know can still be useful. They may not copy the bad thing from us, but we still have good things. We still have people who, I, I have, I mentioned a friend, Mbazulike Amish, is there alive today. He's not a rich man. I'm not a rich man, but we survive. So let them take the good aspect of us Anything bad, they are in a position to know. Don't let them take anything bad. But the most important thing that we had, which I hope that we will come back and the younger ones will cultivate, cultivate, is patriotism. Let people be committed to their nation because there will be Nigeria for the next 100, 200, more hundred years to come, unless maybe nuclear bomb is used to destroy people. So let us, then let us, those who are thinking in terms of their tribes, their ethnicity, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are short-sighted people. I, I, I know, I said somewhere that in the next hundred years, there will be that is my calculation. There will be only three languages that will be around, that will be spoken freely in Nigeria. Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausa. This is because of many reasons that I don't have much time. But Birom or Ichekiri, in a hundred years' time, they actually will not be speaking Birom or Ichekiri. So they have the country. This country will be there for them. This uh, mistake we made will one day be forgotten. Others pass through this same uh, route. And now they have revived themselves, they have changed their attitude, and they are doing better. The example is South Korea. There are other countries, Indonesia, Brazil, and so on. So we can still make it. Our children should forget, don't let them copy bad habit from us. Do away with it. Copy the good one. Let them be in Nigeria, let them commit themselves to Nigeria, to its well-being and to its progress and to its future, because the country belongs to them, not to us. According to the statistics, people at my age are not up to 1% of the population of Nigeria today. So we are gone. It's only the special grace of God that few of us are around. But in my area, if I'm looking for somebody who is my age, it will take me hours to count five. So the future belong to the younger ones, it is up to them to build that future. And they can do it. I believe they can do it. Let them forget about the bad habit of us and our younger ones. Let them imbibe the spirit of patriotism, work for their country, build the country for themselves and for their children and grandchildren. Thank you very much. Sir, thank you so much for that. And I think I just want to highlight a point you made. Um, I think our generation, a lot of the time, we've looked at, let's say, the generation just above us, those in my father's age bracket, and said, okay, these are our examples. And the issue being more often than not, they're not the best example. Your generation comes from a time where truly Nigeria was in yeah. the best of places. And I think I'm so grateful thank for you. this platform and for these conversations because these people here are those that we're meant to be learning from and we just don't see enough of you there aren't enough of you let's be honest mm -hmm. to be able to see you see the example you once set and learn from that and so mm -hmm. i think definitely the issue has been, a lot of the time been with my generation we think nigeria is hopeless because we haven't at any point seen the hope 
you and others like you have seen us progress to where we are now, but you've definitely seen us in shining golden times. And we need to take more time to learn about history so we can know where we're going to go forward from. So thank, thank you so very much for your encouragement. Well, thank you. Uh, Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got uh, uh, the one and only Mr. Lati Law who has been uh, with okay. there on okay. the wings all along. I said that uh, BC uh, has the history of Kanu written in him. I uh, like BC to come in now and share a little from that era. Yeah, BC, go ahead. Uh -oh. Go ahead, BC. Next question, please. Uh, BC. Next question, please. Uh, okay. Uh, in that case, let me invite um, um, uh, Chike on the iPad or uh, or Taiwa Ditunji. Taiwa Ditunji. Well, okay. Oh, uh, 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 Mr. I'm on. Okay. Yes, how okay. are you? All right. Yeah, you saw the Chike on the iPad. You didn't see yeah. the video yet. <laughs> um, Thank you very much, Pat, for organizing this. And I really like to thank uh, Alaji for really bringing us, you know, back to, you know, to think about what had happened in the past. Um, but uh, there is a question that uh, Alaji really didn't answer, which I really want to now try to expand on. Because your question, what, what you put across was on uh, what does he think about restructuring? And his answer to that was that um, he believes in a very strong Nigeria. We all do believe in strong Nigeria. I think there's a lot of uh, misconception about restructure. Uh, Alaji is um, they are one of he's one of the very few elders that are still left when we really run a very a true federal system where there was real healthy competition among the federating units. The development we've had in this country was during that period. You can call it regions or whatever we want to call it, or states, but what we have now, where everybody has to go at the beginning of each month, cap in hand, to, to, to Abuja, and from Abuja, there they are deciding on what will happen on agriculture. It's, that's not a federal system. One of the strongest nations in the world today is the United States of America. And that's a very good example of a federal system of government. California, for example, is number fifth uh, strong and the largest economy in the world. It's in the United States there. Even the states held, they compete among themselves healthily. Now you talk about the old Western region, because what we have now, apart from not, uh, uh, you know, the, the military has really influenced what we are doing. The period of military government that we have here, yeah, where you have this command, uh, where the head of state is there and giving orders to the governors, we, we still run that system. Even right now, the people in Abuja, they think they should be dictating to the governors on what to do, especially if they are governors of the same party. But if you take example of what we had in the West, we, uh, we know, in all the regions, you take Western region that I'm familiar with, Western region extended at that time before the creation of the Midwest region. From Fade, yes, it's gonna try they could do yes. it there. To yeah, frozen that, that was Western region. How many how many ministers do they have? Twelve that same region now. 
has eight, eight, uh, eight states, all the western, southwestern states, plus the two and Delta. How many commissioners do they have? Each of them have, on the average, 20, plus all the, plus all the other assistants and all, plus all the cars who will pass. By the time they finish paying the overhead and the rest of them, they don't have money to do for any development. They all go into personal cost, and they still the one that want to they will steal. Mm, sure. okay. Now, when we run the regions, or we have the true federal system, you know, it, by our independence, we had only one one uh, university apart from Yaba College of uh, uh, Technology, That's University of Ibadan. By the time Zeke, you know, uh, started the University of Nigeria and Suka before you could stay in the province. I mean, Amadibelo and Awolo, they have started the University of Ife and Amadibelo University. It was heavy competition. So when we are talking of when we are talking of restructuring, we are talking about running a two federal system. And the true federal system does not really make a nation uh, not strong. It will not. So until the cost of governance now, now if you look at our budget, even at the federal system, the budget of 19, I mean of the 20, 2018 budget, by the time we analyze the 2018 budget performance in 2019, the uh, the uh, staff personal cost plus debt plus debt uh, uh, payment debt service was a hundred and forty percent of our revenue. How can we run a country like that? That's, that's why we don't have any development. So we really need to talk about this restructuring. The restructuring is not; it might be political, but it's more of eco uh, of uh, an economic development. Until we really do that. So that each each federating unit, whatever you call it, can also have a way of developing. A lot of power has been concentrated in the center, even up to or even up to primary health. Some senators there they, they come in, they go to their villages or so to dig a, a, a borehole. So we have to really talk about that for the for the benefit of the young people coming and for the eco economic development of this country until we really address that issue our economic growth will continue to be stunted thank you so maybe maybe Elijah would like to uh, look at it that that will restructure does not mean that we can remain strong uh, thank you very much i, I think that but, uh, let's see if we can still get BC Olati Low back uh, because uh, he yeah. was having trouble coming in. So, BC, are you able to come in now? Hello, BC. All right, if BC is still having a, a problem, let's uh, see if Olati Kesai can say a quick word about uh, Mr. Chicken Wans. Uh, Comments. Okay. All right. Uh, let's return that case to uh, Professor Ibrahim. Uh, Jibo. Okay. But yeah, okay, but yes, 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 indeed. I, I, I didn't finish. Okay, please go ahead. Yes, you see, what I asked, if you read all the papers where I commented on this structure, I asked for a definition because I don't want, I'm too old to be taken by at the moment I was you said I was commissioned to finance can for three years and they seventy percent nine seventy percent of our revenue, federal and state, go for 
personal emolument and other charges, yeah. not for development. Three, percent uh, itself is not going for development because you get yes. the corruption out of that thirty percent, and the least would be ten percent. The best we can get for the people is twenty percent. So I, 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 I am in support of making whatever changes that will make sure that our revenue, substantial part of our revenue is expanded on development. Otherwise, we can't go anywhere. All I well, need thank you is to, mm. for, for people to define what is restructuring. I don't like slogans. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Uh, we have slogan of change, change. Today is five years since the change. I didn't see any change for the better. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be yeah. there by the time President Buhari will finish his term, three years from now. I would like to see some change. I know they say they are making changes. I don't see it. <laughs> it's not because I hate anybody, but I don't see it. I, what I want is people to get jobs. To, to do away with poverty, to see development. Taba Palewa started by inviting Nadeko, is a company in Netherlands. They brought out very good program. The military take over, do away with that program till today. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you completely on that. Uh, those uh, uh, matters, I think that uh, uh, governance has suffered uh, uh, enormously and that uh, corruption has been um, the bane of development. I actually like to make a, a point that shocks me. There, there are one or two friends of mine who are ministers. Each time I run into them, what they say is, look, you don't understand the problem. The problem is that whenever we get a budget, what you see is the, as our budget, outside of salaries, and uh, maybe five or ten percent on top of it, the rest is for national assembly people who come and take it. And I wonder how a minister can say that, but I hear that all the time. So we do have a serious national problem, which comes, in my opinion, because citizens don't get up and hold people in public life accountable. Uh, That's correct. Nigerians of patriotic uh, disposition are therefore quite frustrated. Uh, unfortunately, time is out. I'm not sure why we can't uh, seem to uh, connect up with Bishop Latilo, but there will be another day. Uh, fortnight from now, uh, we'll have another double header. Um, uh, uh, we will disclose this to you, but we know that uh, another nanogenurian uh, is. Uh, Hanging by uh, Dr. Umailazu, who has worked uh, as the first head of Nigerian think tank from our inside of government uh, uh, back in the old uh, Obasanjo military days, uh, is uh, on the queue. We have Dr. Christopher Kolade also on the queue, and Dr. Michael Omolayoli. So um, we'll have a double header. A fortnight for now. So permit me to thank our special guest, Abana. Yeah, yes. Mr. Yeah. Latilo just joined. So maybe you can. Joined. Okay. Okay. The last minute word. Okay. Okay. Uh, they say you're back on. Can you then say some words? Uh, that's all done. Oh dear. Where is he from? Where is he talking from? Uh, uh, this is actually in Lagos. That's what, uh, okay, here he is. Where I is hope this time you can come. Who's yeah, go ahead, Mr. Yeah, yeah. Yes, the, we, we have to go, so you have to quickly. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm not hearing you. You have to try hard. He needs to unmute himself. Unmute, unmute yourself. Unmute. 
Aha, you can hear you now. Ah, it's gone again. I heard you for one second. Okay, go ahead. It's still muted. It's just, okay, unmute, unmute. Are we able to unmute him from our end here? No, he has to unmute himself. Uh, he has to unmute himself. I'm trying to unmute him and he's not. Unmute. Hello? Aha, yeah. Okay, come now. All right. All right. Uh, I have been. Am I okay then? Yes, you're okay now. Yeah, I've been with you guys for almost an hour. Thank, thank you very much, Pat, yeah. for this very uh, great platform. But I just remember my days in Kano uh, when Nigeria was one. And I keep mm. asking, where's the missing link? And happy that Alaji Yakasai is here. And a couple of our friends who have also, Admiral Lanyela, who also has a stint in Kano, but more than a stint in Kano. I had to leave Kano in 66. Uh, I was born in 53, and I spent all my life there. Well, I mean, like growing up years there. And um, the, the, I think the takeaway from me would be that, although I'm Yoruba, as you all know, I lived, I had to live in the north to be able to speak Igbo. Mm -hmm. And I should tell you the kind of Nigeria we were in in those days. Can we return back to this good old times? Only yesterday I was at an event somewhere. This was what I kept preaching. And I think the youths, I mean, the youths have quite a lot to do. Alaji Yakasai has said he's 94. So what are the youths waiting for? And somebody was saying something, one of the social media platforms, and I listened to it, and it made a lot of sense. It caught, it caught a great, what do you call it, made, made, made a lot of sense. So most of the youths don't even, they don't, they don't, they don't seem to be uh, watching the people like uh, Alaji Dangote and all of those who have made their money in a clean way. But they would rather be, you know, um, going after the young ones. Who, who have more than millions of likes and I the rest we have but I can go say, for instance, who is supposed to be a very good role model, as just uh, you could count how many likes he has. So he's just saying that the youths have to rebuild themselves so that uh, they don't also belong to a Western generation, like some people, they describe some generations as Western, but that's not the way I want to look at this. I'm just appealing to the youths. I mean, at 67, I think... <laughs> Uh, well, we we have, we have paid our dues, and they will continue to help our, our country, like 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 me, like you, uh, Prof, who has uh, left everything we're doing today as you've always done. You believe more in self worth than the net worth. That's what you preach, mm -hmm. uh, Pat, and I, I want to thank you for that. Uh, whatever we can do, uh, because all my life I've been serving Nigeria, and I will continue to do that in any way that I find I mean, that you guys want to annoy me or any service at all. The other day, you remember, Pat, mm. when you talked about 50 years of the Civil War, mm. you you had only finished talking about it, and I, I, I lashed on it, and we came, we covered with Ed, uh, because a lot of people who were not bound during the end, I mean, before the Civil War and after the Civil War, had some lessons to learn. And I'm happy that so many people came for this. Uh, Professor... Wally Shawinka was there and so on and so forth. All I'm just saying, my simple message is let us go back to the way we used to be. I never knew it. I mean, for God's sake, my, my, my praise name as a little boy child is Alani. But the Igbos would rather say Alami. Mama Alami, Mama Alami. You never meant anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Baptist Day School, and I'm sure that uh, Pat might must have attended. Is it Igbo Union? I went to St. Thomas's. No, no, no. St. Thomas's. Is that <laughs> you know, who went to Igbo Union <laughs> up the road from us on Kano, on Aba Road? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> we're all in the same area, actually. It was beautiful. Uh, you know, as Christians, when we had a, when, I, when we had all our, you know, all our festivals. The, the, the uh, our friends from the uh, from Sabun Giri, from Kuber Mata, Kuber Iberi, they will come and rejoice with us. And when they had theirs, also was did the same thing. My my Igbo name was uh, uh, my house name was uh, um, 
Aminu, that's what they were calling Aminu. it. We lived on the Gold Coast Road at, at the time. Oh, it was very right. fine, the bush, in the bush. Mm. Uh, what was that? You were in the bush. No, <laughs> bush at that time. Gold Coast bush. was bush road. Bush that you don't know, you very, don't far, know very far, very far. You had a fish. It is a lie. What is it? What are you doing? Gold Coast Road. <laughs> Let him. Uh, if if, if if Pa Mike, if Pa Mike, Nini, if I'm Nini here, you like what? He will wake up from the grave. Pa Mike was coming to Honeywell Hotel to do his trade. Yeah. That's where he started. That's true. That's I'm true. sure that um, the, the Okonkwo and the okay, the, the, the Amungo Okonkwo and and so on and so forth. Yeah. It was a, it was a very happy happy time for all, for all of us there, and I'm happy that uh, some people like the part. In my own little way, in my little sphere, I'm also trying to see how we can get back to the good times. Uh, I had uh, like Yakasai say that in the end, we might end, we might end up with three languages. He said, Hausa, Igbo, Yoruba. So what do we do to the rest? <laughs> <laughs> like in India, in, in India, they have speak Hindi. Even though they have three languages as we have. In India, they have to speak Hindi, even though they have as many languages as we have. And no, I think it's yeah. a good way to uh, make sure that everybody we don't marginalize any language at all. Because already, <laughs> I'm hearing a lot of stories about marginalization. They say, yeah. if I have most of them tell to say me, maybe I'm a marginalizer because I speak what I speak outside. Speak. <laughs> I don't speak more than that. So what's, what's my, <laughs> why do I go back All right. English? Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Abel, thank you very much for this great Pat, platform. Pat, Pat, please, if I may done. just contribute one okay. thing, please. One thing. One hey, thing, see? please. Soldier, I want to come we out must and remove... switch gone. <laughs> <Pat>. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I hear yeah, you. Come on. Pat, I, 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 must, allow us to say something. We, come on. Must remove, we, we, we must remove those things that prevent the younger people from participating in politics. The politics mm. we have now is sort that the younger people will not take part. It's all about money. 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 It's all about money. You know, yes. the, the, the divide us. Okay? We must mm. remove all those things. And you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, we are talking of restructuring, restructuring, restructuring. It has to start from the assembly, and these assembly people will not restructure us. Mm. Let me tell you the truth. No. Mm. We have to restructure our minds. We have to restructure our economy. We have to then restructure our physical being in this country. Otherwise, we'll get in nowhere. This country is God blessed. Mm. Even America knows what God has put in this country. Mm. He hasn't put anywhere else in the world. So the younger people, you have a future. You have one of the greatest, you can become even greater than America. The resources are there. You have to take charge yourself. The older men will not allow you. Okay? But you have to take charge yourself. Yes. We have to remove those systems that prevent them from rearing their heads. Lovely. Thank you, uh, thank you so very much. Um, on, on the closing note, um, the question has been asked, what are the action points from this? That is clearly one of the action points. We must do something. I, I can't talk about it fully here, but I'm working on a project with others for that to happen to ensure that as a as, as a, a group, group of, of activists politicians, politicians that we that we create a new, a new kind, kind of politics, politics in nigeria, nigeria where, where poli money, is, money is, not is not a factor we must, we must deliberately, deliberately bring young, young people into positions of leadership and mentor them up um Whatever it is we say, this current order is extremely corrupt. It's not working. And we have to rebuild Nigeria. Young people will be encouraged if they have to go on the streets to force a real change. As Anila has said, this National Assembly cannot change Nigeria. It is the problem with Nigeria. So, and there are ways that this can change, and it must change if we are going to have a future for our children. So I thank you all so much. I, I, I begin with uh, Alaji Tenko Yakesai, 
uh, we did not think he would it would last uh, two hours. You know, at ninety four, what incredible sacrifice! So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank Professor uh, Jibreen, uh, thank you very much, Admiral Ayila. Thank you very much, Mr. Latilo. Thank you very much. And for all of us who have come to this meeting, truly appreciate this National Town Hall that we are having, and we'll keep it up every fortnight. The goal is to go to every week, but let's have fortnightly for now. I think Nigeria will rise up again, which is my personal mantra. Uh, if I had a good voice, I would sing my favorite song, which is Nigeria will rise up again. But my voice is horrible. I can inflict it. If I had only Admiral Ad 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 there, I would inflict it on him. I like to punish him. <laughs> I saw, Nigeria will rise I punish, up again. I saw punish I saw punish part when we were in school. That's why he's always talking about me. Yeah, we rise up again. Thank you all. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> These people didn't allow me to pray today. <laughs> so much meeting, meeting, meeting. Bye. Bye, Pat. Bye bye, yo. Bye. Come and see Oh, Iman, 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 Iman,